In this video, we are talking about the respiratory pigments among chordates and non-chordates. So students, this is a very important topic in your syllabus as per the respiratory mechanisms are concerned or the physiology of respiratory system is concerned. So in the respiratory system, we had discussed the morphology or the anatomy, you can say, of the respiratory systems of different animals. We had discussed about the respiratory organs that are present in various invertebrates and vertebrates. But in this particular topic, we are discussing the importance or the presence of specific respiratory pigments which are present in the circulatory system or here we can say as blood for transporting the gases from one place to another with a quality of taking up the gas and releasing the gas wherever it is necessary. So this is the major function of the respiratory pigments that they can take up the oxygen or they can take up the carbon dioxide, they can go to some specific place and they can release that particular gas uh, wherever it is required. So that is the basic function of the respiratory pigments. Now the uptake, the mechanism of transportation and the third thing is the delivery of the gas these are the three basic, uh, you can say, steps in the functioning of the respiratory pigments. So first is the uptake of the gas, second is the transportation of the gas, and third is the delivery of the gas to the target tissue. So these three steps, they are achieved by a group of colored proteins, which are also known as the chromoproteins. As we know that chromo refers to the color. So these are colored proteins because they have got some, some elemental part which gives a particular color to these pigments. So they can be red in color, they can be blue or they can be green in color. They may be colorless but where the pigments are present that blood will have some kind of color. So, now there is a very basic uh, feature of these respiratory pigments. This feature is that they can reversibly combine with gases. Either it is oxygen or it is carbon dioxide. So this is a reversible or you can say a temporary uptake of the gas from high tensions of that particular gas suppose it is uh, if we talk about the lung level so the partial pressure of oxygen is higher at the alveolar level and if we talk about the tissue level there the partial oxygen level will be lower so what the pigments do, they take up the gas from higher partial pressures and they release the gas wherever the partial pressures are low. The next factor is that a respiratory pigment can function in three ways. So this is a very important point. The first way can be that it might be like uh, the hemoglobin of vertebrates which is continuously taking up the oxygen and is conveying it to the tissues so it is an oxygen carrier so here the pigment is continuously taking up the gas from one place and it is releasing though that gas at where it is required so this is the first kind of functioning or it is the first way of functioning of respiratory pigment. The second case can be that 
the, the pigment it might take up oxygen only and only at a low tension level that means suppose an animal is living in a aquatic environment it is taking up the oxygen through general body surface so there is no problem in taking up the oxygen but here if the diffusion of oxygen it decreases to some extent then the pigment can take up the oxygen and can transport it to the required or the target organs or the target tissues so here the respiratory pigments they are only taking up the gas when the partial pressures are low so that might be the second uh, kind of a way the third way can be that the pigment can act as oxygen store that means the respiratory pigment can take up oxygen and store it for some time that means it is not transporting the gas on the same time when it is taking up so it is taking up the oxygen it is storing it for some time and whenever required when the partial pressure of the oxygen it lowers at a particular tissue level it can release its oxygen over there so these are the three main ways of a respiratory pigment to work now before starting the topic i must give you an idea of uh, the physical exchange of gases over the respiratory surfaces so for this we have to go first of all for the composition of the atmospheric air so the atmospheric air which we inhale has uh, a near about 20 percent of oxygen the carbon dioxide is only and only 0 0.04 percent and the nitrogen is near to 79 percent so other gases are present in trace amounts very small amounts but they are not of physiological importance for the animals so here what i want to say is that the most important gases are the carbon dioxide and the oxygen because we require oxygen for the respiration process for the oxidation of the food so that's why we need oxygen for for the process now if we go for the composition of the expired gases that we exhale uh, the expired air it contains the same amount of nitrogen as the inspired air that means 79 percent we are taking in and we are exhaling also 90 uh, 79 percent nitrogen but the oxygen it has been reduced to about 15 percent and the carbon dioxide increases to about 5 percent in the exhaled air so that means about one fourth of the oxygen of the inspired air has passed into the blood and has been replaced by the equal amounts of carbon dioxide which has left the blood so that means we have given in the oxygen and we have taken out the carbon dioxide now students there is a concept of uh, partial pressures of gases so this is again very very important concept uh, we had discussed in uh, we have discussed this particular topic in respiratory organs also but here i want to again emphasize on this particular thing that what is partial pressure of a gas see uh, suppose if we have a box and in that box there is air so in the mixture of gases in that box each gas exerts its own partial pressure 
so that is a very very important line that every gas has its own partial pressure that is exerted on the walls of that particular box suppose if you are talking about oxygen then what is the partial pressure of oxygen so it is the pressure exerted by only and only oxygen towards the walls of that box because the box has got a mixture of gases and only the pressure of oxygen it will be the partial pressure of oxygen in that box so uh, the partial pressure is a very important phenomenon as per the respiratory pigments they are concerned so if the partial pressure is higher the pigments will take up the gas if the partial pressure of the gas is low they will release the gas so this is the basic mechanism if we talk about the diffusion of gases in the lungs then the exchange of gases between the alveoli and the blood it can be like if I give uh, you the partial pressures what is the physiology of that particular exchange see the oxygen tension in the alveolar air that means that the oxygen which we have taken in which we have inspired that puts a partial pressure of 107 mmhg it is 107 at the lung level so we are talking about the lung level in the alveoli of the lungs the partial pressure of oxygen is 107 now here the oxygen tension in the blood is 40 mm so there is a huge difference in between the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen and the blood partial pressure of oxygen uh, one side it is 107 and at the blood side it is 40 so there is a difference of 67 mm hg so this pressure this pressure difference i should say it serves to derive the oxygen from the alveolar air into the as you can say the blood stream so this is a huge difference at the lung level so if we talk about uh, uh, the carbon dioxide tension suppose uh, at the lung level so what is the tension that carbon dioxide uh, inside the alveolar air has got a partial pressure of 36 oxygen was 107 and the carbon dioxide is 36 so here we should have a higher carbon dioxide partial pressure in the blood so here in the blood the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 46 mm so there is a difference of 10 mm hg partial pressure so uh, this is a relatively you can say it is a small difference of 10 mm hg but it is sufficient to drive the carbon dioxide from the blood into the lungs so this small difference is the pressure which is adequate because of the rapidity of diffusion of carbon dioxide through the alveolar membrane so carbon dioxide can rapidly come inside the alveoli and that carbon dioxide will be expired out in the exhalation so which we have discussed earlier in the composition of the expired air so so these this is the partial pressure physiology at the lung level so this is a very very important thing to note okay now we have a concept of oxygen efficiency now here this graph is showing you what is oxygen efficiency now this 
particular VO2 is the oxygen consumption on one side of the graph. So as we go up, we have the increased oxygen consumption. And at one side, we have got oxygen delivery, DO2. That means the oxygen delivered to that particular tissue. So this graph, it pertains to the tissue level physiology. So as the tissues oxygen consumption increases, the oxygen delivery also increases. Now the, you see the graph, you see the B curve in the very center. So here we have written delivery dependent. So as the oxygen consumption increases, the oxygen delivery also increases. So that give rise to the component B of the graph. So it is rising up to the level of critical point. So this is the critical point. As you see, this critical point is coming at a point on line B where the line A starts. So this is the critical point at which if you increase the oxygen delivery but you don't have the increased oxygen consumption because a tissue can consume oxygen uh, at a particular threshold level because it needs oxygen at a threshold level. So it cannot use extra oxygen for respiration process. So that means that at the critical point, if you give more of oxygen to the tissue, there is no increased oxygen consumption. So a plateau, it comes over as it is shown in line A. So it is a straight line, a horizontal straight line. So here we have written delivery independent. That means it is not dependent upon delivery. So you can increase the delivery, but you cannot increase the oxygen consumption. So we have a concept of oxygen efficiency. Here we have written an equation OE is equal to VO2 over DO2. So that means oxygen efficiency of a tissue will be the division of the oxygen consumption by the oxygen delivery. So that can give you the efficiency of uh, a tissue. Now we are starting with the, the respiratory pigments and what are the respiratory pigments. So here, first of all, they are conjugated proteins. So <clears throat> the respiratory pigments, they are conjugated type of proteins. They may have a non-protein part as the heme group in hemoglobin. So they may have a metal component also. So basically they are all conjugated proteins. We will be seeing in the later slides. So the protein it combines with the metallic group which gives a characteristic color on oxygenation. So we have discussed earlier that it can be red in color, they can be like blue in color, they can be green in color. So it depends upon the metallic group which is giving it a particular color. That's why they are also called as chromoproteins. Now they impart a definite color to the body fluids. So that means if pigments are red in color, so the blood will be red in color. If they are blue, blood will be blue in color. So they impart a definite color to the body fluid, that is blood. Now this slide, it is giving you the four major important classes of respiratory pigments. On the very top, we have got the hemoglobin. Second is the hemocyanin. Third is the hemoerythrin. And fourth one is the chlorocruorin. So these are the four major classes of the respiratory pigments. So <clears throat> as we are discussing these pigments, so first of all, 
we are taking up the functions of these respiratory pigments before starting them one by one. So as we have earlier discussed that the major function of the pigments is the gas transport. So either it may be oxygen, it may be carbon dioxide. Both the gases are physiological important. Physiologically they are very very important for the animals. So we are not concerned with here uh, the nitrogen or we are not concerned about the other gases or the trace gases which are present in the inspired air. But here we are concerned with the oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now the gas or the oxygen storage may be one of the function of the respiratory pigments. As we have discussed in the ways of uh, the functioning of the respiratory pigments. So respiratory pigments they are also functioning to store a gas for a particular time. And if uh, sometimes the partial pressure it decreases at the tissue level so they can give you the gas. They can deliver the gas at that particular time. Now the third function is the pH buffers. That means these pigments they are also helping in maintaining the physiological buffer systems in the blood. So everybody knows that blood has got its own pH so that has to be maintained. So that pH buffering capacity is also conveyed by the respiratory pigments. So this is one of the functions. Now the fourth function which has been mentioned is enhancing the gradients for gas diffusion. So that means if the gas is diffusing inside, what is the concentration gradient over there? It is like if it is general body surface, the gradient can be like very low. But in case of respiratory gases, these gradients are very very high. As we have discussed earlier in the case of uh, at the lung level, in the case of hemoglobin, we have got a partial pressure of oxygen at 107 and we have a partial pressure at the blood level as 40. So there is a huge difference of 67. So this is a very good difference to take up the oxygen by these respiratory pigments. So they enhance the gradients or the difference for gas diffusion. Now we are starting with our very first very known the common respiratory pigment which is the hemoglobin. So we had we are having a particular physical picture of hemoglobin in our mind that hemo him is referring to red color. So is it having a, uh, if we have hemo in uh, a particular word, we refer to it as a red colored compound. So hemoglobin is a combination. If you take this particular word hemoglobin, so it has got two words, heme and globin. So here the heme group, it is attached to the globin protein. So that's why it is hemoglobin. So it is widely distributed and it is widely distributed in vertebrates. Now this hemoglobin is present in the erythrocytes. That means it is present in the RBCs. It is not present in the plasma. So this is a characteristic feature of hemoglobin that it resides in the RBCs of the vertebrates. Now in vertebrates, if they are having hemoglobin, it is dissolved in the blood plasma. This is the difference. In the vertebrates, it is present in the RBCs. In the invertebrates, it is dissolved in the plasma. So it is not present in the corpuscles. Next is that oxygen carrying capacity is high. 
So the hemoglobin can transport a good amounts of oxygen from the lung level to the tissue level. So here the hemoglobin as it has got four heme groups in one hemoglobin. I'll be discussing it later on. So every heme group or I can say the iron part it can take up one O2 molecule. So if we have got four iron parts in one hemoglobin they can take up four O2 molecules. So it is a good oxygen carrying capacity. Now next is efficient vehicle for oxygen transport. So as we have discussed that the partial pressure difference is quite high. So in that particular case hemoglobin serves as an efficient oxygen transporting pigment. Now next is it is produced by liver cells. So uh, we will be taking up in the synthesis. So it is synthesized from the acetic acid and glycine amino acid to form the porphyrin ring which again combines with iron to form the heme molecule. So this particular part we will be taking it up in the next slide. So here this is the formation of hemoglobin we have discussed it in reaction form. So first of all acetic acid it combines with the glycine to form a porphyrin ring. Now this porphyrin ring it joins the iron moiety to form the heme group. That means the heme it is containing the porphyrin ring and the iron molecule. Next four heme groups it combines with one globin protein to form one hemoglobin molecule. So this is a very very important reaction. So you can write it on your copies. So <clears throat> hemoglobin is formed primarily of the acetic acid and glycine with iron with globin. So here the globin is the protein part and the heme is a non-protein part. That means hemoglobin is composed of both protein and a non-protein part. Now if we go with the structure of hemoglobin we have a heme group like this. Now here you can see the iron moiety in the very center of this heme group. Now if I go back and see we have got four heme groups in one hemoglobin. So that means we have got four these kind of four heme groups in one hemoglobin. Now how it is formed? Just see. Yeah, this is the structure of hemoglobin molecule. So here you can see that we have got four heme groups. So here in the right upper corner it has been written as a heme group. So we have got one, two, three and four heme groups. In the heme group a red colored round bead structure is present which is the iron moiety. So in each heme group we have got four heme groups and in the very center we have got four iron moieties and they are joined with the globin protein. Now where is the globin protein? Here we have got four parts of the globin protein. In the globin we have got two alpha chains and two beta chains. If we go for the first alpha chain it is of the orange color which is grabbing one heme group inside it. Second alpha chain is of violet color very diagonally present. Third is the beta chain which is of green color and fourth beta chain 
fourth chain of hemoglobin is of the red color that means the globin protein is composed of four chains two alpha and two beta and these four chains are enclosing four heme groups and each heme group has one iron moiety so this is the basic molecular structure of hemoglobin i think you are clear about this now the color of the blood is due to heme that means as we have discussed earlier the color of the pigment or the color of the blood is due to the metallic the metallic part of the pigment so this is due to the heme heme is containing the iron moiety in humans it is a tetramer tetramer means it is composed of four monomers so one monomer is containing a globin chain either it is alpha or beta and it is containing one heme group and a one iron group so these are four monomers and this is a tetramer as a whole now the molecular weight in the corpuscles of hemoglobin is about 68000 kilo daltons so this is the molecular weight in the solution it may be like very very high in glycera and notomatous the two monomers with the molecular weight of 34000 kda are present so this is one of the example so vertebrate hemoglobin it is different in the amino acid composition the arrangement and oxygen binding characteristics are also different so that means the hemoglobin in different vertebrates it can be different in amino acid composition their arrangement and the oxygen binding characteristics so in the later slides we'll be taking up the oxygen binding capacities of the hemoglobin in different vertebrates and in vertebrates so that is a very very important part as per the physiology of the respiratory pigments is concerned now here in this slide again we are trying to give you the structure of the hemoglobin so we have got four globin chains two are alpha alpha 1 and 2 beta 1 and 2 these are four chains each chain is enclosing one heme group and one heme group is like uh as shown in the circle and it is enclosing one fe moiety now this fe can take up one oxygen molecule that simply means if we are having four heme groups the yellow circles these are the four heme groups and one heme group can take up one o2 that means one hemoglobin can take up four o2 molecules now here it is shown that the oxygen molecules are taken up by the heme groups so it is taking up four oxygen molecules on the very right side it has been shown that the blue colored oxygen molecules are taken up by four heme groups so this is the reaction form hb it takes up four o2 molecules and it makes oxyhemoglobin so oxyhemoglobin can be written as hb o2 four times that means one single hb is taking four molecules of o2 so this is the formation of oxyhemoglobin now in this particular slide we are talking about a particular change in the amino acid sequence of the globin protein so what is the normal hemoglobin beta chain structure that we have got a valine then we have a histidine the leucine 
then we have the threonine, then we have the proline, then we have the glutamic acid, then we have again a glutamic acid. But in the lower case, you can very well see if we have a changed amino acid, what is the change? That valine has changed the glutamic acid. So the first glutamic acid in the normal hemoglobin beta chain has been changed with the valine. So that, that change basically results in the formation of a particular, you can say, uh, disease which is called as the sickle cell anemia. Now, in the lower photographs, you can very well see at the very left side, you have got the normal blood cells. This is a one RBC of uh, the vertebrates. If you see on the right side, we have got a sickle shaped RBC. So this sickle cell anemia is due to the change of a single amino acid in the beta chain of the hemoglobin. So that was what the sickle cell anemia change. Now, at the lung level, we have discussed it earlier also. If you see the very first diagram of the lungs, this is showing about six alveoli in the lung. Oxygen is coming in. This is the inspired oxygen. This oxygen, it is transferred to the blood cell. Now this is a very very important slide you should concentrate on the red blood cell the hb the hemoglobin which is present in the red blood cell it is uh, you can say primarily it is combining with the hydrogen ions so one h is you can say stuck up with this hemoglobin so here it is written as HHB. Now it releases the hydrogen on the right side you can see and it becomes HB. Now this HB can take up the oxygen. So when it is taking up oxygen it forms HBO2. Now this HBO2 is the very particular reaction which we have discussed in the earlier slides that HB combines with O2. This should be 4O2 and makes HBO2 like four times. So this is the oxyhemoglobin formation. Now the H which is released by the hemoglobin on the very right side, it joins the bicarbonate ion which is present in the plasma. So this is a kind of buffer system that is present in the blood plasma and HCO negative ions are profusely present in the plasma. Now they are diffusing inside the RBC and they are combining with that H plus the hydrogen ion, the proton and they are converting into the bicarbonic acid H2CO3. Now it releases H2CO3 releases the water and it also releasing, it is also releasing CO2. Now this carbon dioxide is taken up by the lungs. It is released into the lungs because of the lower partial pressure. So as we have discussed earlier, at the lung level, the CO2 concentration or the partial pressure is 36 but CO2 in the red blood cell is 46 mmHg. So this is the difference of 10 in the carbon dioxide transport from the blood to the lung. If we take up the first uh, case of the oxygen which is shown here as it is going from lungs to RBC it is by the partial pressure difference of 67 mm Hg. So this is the whole lot of process, the physiological process at the level of the lungs. So here we should emphasize that 
the reduced form of hemoglobin which is acting as a buffer which is written here as HHB so this is the reduced form and it is releasing H ions H ions means acidity so if it is releasing if it is releasing H ions it can make acidity so this is a kind of a buffer system if it is taking up H ions so that may decrease the acidity on the contrary on the other side if we are taking up HCO3 negative which is coming inside the RBC from the plasma it is also taking up the carbon dioxide in the form of CO can you can you concentrate on this HCO negative so it is containing the carbon dioxide in the form of CO so when it comes inside the red blood cell it is combining with the H ions and then it is releasing the CO2 so that means the carbon dioxide can be coming in two ways it can come via plasma in the form of HCO second it can come in the form of carboxyhemoglobin inside the RBC so that is the next form so as we have uh, as we are seeing here the formation of oxyhemoglobin HBO2 carbon dioxide may also come as HBCO2 so that is the second form okay so that was the physiology at the lung level next if we are going for the tissue level physiology what is at the tissue level that we have got a low partial oxygen levels at tissues so at the left side we have got the tissues on the right side we have got the blood so here in the blood if we see the oxygen first of all the HbO2 has now come to the tissue level from the lung level in the very first slide the HbO2 was formed and now this oxyhemoglobin has reached the tissues as written on the right side now this HbO2 it releases its oxygen so the physiology here uh, will be taking up later as the conditions in at the tissue levels they are different from the conditions of the lung level here the HbO2 will release O2 hemoglobin will be released in the red blood cell so this hemoglobin it will regain its reduced form by combining with the H ions so it is going for it again the cycle so it is making again HbH and the oxygen which is released in the red blood cell it will come into the tissue because the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissue is lower than the partial pressure in the blood so it is coming inside the tissue cells so here it has been written as cell metabolism so the cell will uh, take up this oxygen it will use the oxygen so this is particularly which we call as a phenomenon which is also known as the assimilation process so assimilation is taking up oxygen and using it for respiratory processes the cell metabolism the oxidation process so this oxygen is used by the tissue and CO2 or the carbon dioxide is formed now this carbon dioxide which is formed in the tissues will aggregate it will increase and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide will increase in the tissue levels by the time as it increases to a particular extent it will be transported it will be taken up by the red blood cells so you can very well see it is taken up by the red blood cells it combines with water again forms the carbonic uh, acid H2CO3 so this particular <coughs> form
form H2CO3. This is a reversible reaction. It can break up into CO2, uh, CO2 and water and both can combine to form H2CO3 also. So this uh, reaction is taken up by the carbonic anhydrase and H2CO3 it again breaks into HCO3 negative and H ions. So these two ions uh, it can diffuse into the plasma H2CO3 uh, negative is diffusing into the plasma and the H ions they are combining again with the HB. So that was the physiology at the tissue level. So if you compare the physiology at the lung level and the tissue level, you can very well see the function of the hemoglobin. So it is taking up oxygen at the lung level. It is taking up this oxygen to the tissue level. It is releasing it because the partial pressure of oxygen is low at tissues. It is taking up the carbon dioxide in the form of HCO3 it is taking it is throwing this HCO3 into the plasma because of the concentration gradient so this HCO3 comes back to the lung level and releases its carbon dioxide so this is one function of the hemoglobin as a pigment so in the next uh, part of the video we'll be discussing up more about the physiology of uh, the respiratory pigments.